Good afternoon. My name is Nan Partlett, and I'm the director of the Emeritus College. I want to welcome you to what promises to be a fascinating conversation among a group of women who are part of the story of Emory University. I want to acknowledge that there are a number of individuals and organizations who have helped to make this event possible. You will see some of those in the programs uh, that I hope you have picked, picked up. In addition, I want to especially thank Gary Houck in the Office of the President and the founding director of the Center for Women, Ali Crown, and the current director, Donna Yarborough. Each of these people have provided encouragement to us and often at the time when we needed encouragement most. The discussion for the, af the afternoon are part of a living history project of the Emeritus College, which chronicles and documents the experiences of Emeritus faculty and administrators within the life of the university. Since the conversation is being taped, we will have a permanent record of what is said here today. And this tape will serve as a resource for all of us and also for generations of learners who will follow us. As a reminder, may I gently say, please, if you have a cell phone, make sure that it is off at this point. The panel that is assembled this afternoon is a group of really extraordinary women, all of whom have made significant contributions to Emory University and to the role of women at Emory. Each has the designation of emerita, and each has been saluted as an unsung heroine, sometimes quietly and behind the scenes, and sometimes much more visibly. Each has worked to make this university a better place to work, study, and grow. It is my privilege to briefly introduce each of our panelists. I will do this quite simply by giving you their name and title so that you will begin to have a sense of who they are and the varied parts of the university in which they have served. Each panelist will in turn tell you a little more about herself and the context of the time in which she arrived at Emory University. This will be followed by a conversation among the panelists. I will begin the introductions on your right proceeding around the table. Dr. Mary Alice Clower, Professor Emerita of Health, Physical Education, and Dance. Dr. Young Fong Sung, Professor Emerita of Medicine. Dr. Julianne Daffin, Associate Vice President Emerita for Campus Life. Dr. Elizabeth Sharp, Professor Emerita of Medicine and Nursing. Dr. Elizabeth Connell, Professor Emerita of Medicine. Dr. Marianne Charbo Dehan, Professor Emerita of Nursing. Professor Brenda Bynum, Professor of Theater and Drama. Dr. Dana Green, Dean Emerita of Oxford College. Dean Green has graciously agreed to moderate the panel this evening, and she will direct the singing, if you will, of unsung stories. <laughs> Dean Green. Well, thank you, Nan. Um, uh, we need to thank um, some other people as well, namely Nan, and Charity uh, a Crabtree, who helped organize uh, this event today. So thank you very much for doing this. Um, we're here, as Nan has said, as uh, Women Emerita, to document our perspective on the university that we've served for many years, and a university that shaped us very personally over these many long years. Um, we begin with the premise that if you don't know the past, you can't understand the present, and you can't imagine a new future. 
We're here to record our past for the sake of the future. Our seven panelists arrived at Emory from different places and at different times in the university's history. They worked in different schools and made different contributions. But collectively, all of these women have given more than 200 years of service to this institution. <laughs> now, none of us has been here for 200 years herself, but among us, I think it's you, Mary Alice, who has the greatest longevity. So if you will begin to tell us how and why and when you came to Emory and what you found when you arrived. I'm Mary Alice Clowell. I started teaching at Emory in 1958. That was a long time ago. I can assure you there have been many, many changes, not only in the physical campus, but also in the college and the university. People ask me, why, why do you want or why did you want to come to Emory University? And I think I have several reasons. And then people would always ask when they found out that I stayed here for 34 years, and why did you stay here for 34 years? Mm -hmm. And I think some of the reasons are the same, and I'd like to mention a few of them. The first one, I needed a job. And I think that might have brought several of us here, but I did need a job. I had just finished getting my master's degree at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. I'd been teaching in high school, and I wanted to give college teaching a try. So I started looking around. I grew up 40 miles south of Atlanta, <clears throat> excuse me, and I had heard about Emory University all my life. Not that I knew much about the college and the university, but I did know a little bit about the hospital and the medical school. But everybody who talked about Emory, it was always with this glow and they appreciated Emory and they thought it was a wonderful place. So I, when I found out there was an opening at Emory, then I thought, hey, that might be the place I should look into. Uh, the department chair, as when I was an undergraduate student and when I was working on my master's, knew Dr. Thomas McDonough, who was chair of the department at that time. And they all thought he was probably one of the best physical education people in the country. Again, I thought that that's certainly a plus. I got here and I have to agree, agree with them. Mr. McDonough was a wonderful physical educator. Uh, when I came on campus for the interview, I was very impressed with the people from administration, and I was also impressed with the people in the, in the uh, Department of Health and Physical Education. One reason I was so impressed with the department is that it was one department. Now, for most of you not being in physical education, back then, the physical education departments were divided. You had men's physical education department on campus and you had women's physical education department on campus. The talk was beginning to start about combining them and lead us to say it was not very pleasant talk. In fact, it did not make for a very good marriage because the men wanted so much, the women wanted so much. But to think here, here's a department that has already done that. They will not have to go through that Men teach women, women teach men, quit educational classes. I thought, what could be better? So that was certainly in the back of my mind too as I was looking uh, at schools. Um, then I guess I was lucky enough to get the job. That's all I can say. I have felt very lucky to be a part of Emory for, for 34 years I was here. And I still feel, still feel very honored to have been a part of it. You know, when you take a job, you sign the contract, and it says you will teach, or you will do this, or you will do something else. So I, come to, I signed the contract, and I thought I would be teaching. But I got to Emory, and I found out it's not just teaching that you do in the physical education department. We, we kept busy in that department. We all taught five or six classes every day. We coached, we worked in intramurals, and any time we had a varsity sporting event, we also, also took time out to work with that, if we were timing or whatever we were doing. 
So we kept busy, and people would always say, hey, you're about ready to go home at 3 or 4 o'clock this afternoon, aren't you? Would say, no, not, not today. We, we're not going to quite make it at 3 or 4 o'clock. Uh, and if some of you who have been here a long time remember, Emory used to sponsor a lot of high school events. And we were always having some type of athletic high school event on the campus. I'll never forget when we had the Southeastern High School swimming meet here, and there were 400 high school students swimming. At that time, all the scoring was kept by hand, paper and pencil. We had no computers then, of course. We only messed up one time. We sent one team home with the first place trophy, and they came in third. <laughs> so so uh, Ed Smike, if some of you remember Ed, had to call that team and ask them to please return the trophy the next day. They did not, did not win. Needless to say, that certainly was not one of our best efforts, but, but we did try. Another thing happened one time that I'd like to just toss in here, because we did have things like this taking place all the time in the department. I was coaching the women's tennis team. We were going, uh, had a match with West Georgia in Carrollton. So we left campus about 12.30. And at that time, we drove the physical plant vans. If some of you remember the physical uh, plant vans, you can appreciate this. They, they were not in the best condition. But here we would go, and we would go down. We would have the match. After the match, we got a bite to eat, and we started home. Oh, about 15 miles out of Carrollton, we had a flat tire. So, so of course, we got that taken care of and headed on our way way to campus. After we got that, we had been traveling probably about 20 miles, and we had the same tire to go flat. So I had to call, I don't know if it was Julianne, I don't know what dean it was, to get word to the dormitories that the, that the uh, women would be coming in. So we finally got home that night about 2 or 2.30. Uh, then one day, a, a, a dream that most of us had had in the department finally came, became a reality. That was in 1983, uh, when the new physical education was, was built. I say new physical education building. Uh, that building is 25 years old this week. That doesn't seem possible. Uh, but with the Woodruff Physical Education Center was open, and there was an immediate explosion on campus. Uh, not only did people who maybe disliked activity, they were even coming to the gym. So we were very pleased to get everybody at least coming over to see the new building. Uh, that, was, that was, I guess, a dream that some of us who had been teaching here for that long never thought would be a reality as long as we were teaching. But it, but it did take place, and it, it just did wonders for our department, not only for our teaching in our physical education courses, but also in women and men's athletics. Of course, I guess you can say from 1983 on, the rest of the growth of what has gone on that building is actually history, because it's just been unbelievable what has taken place. Uh, there is one thing I would like to just brag about just a little bit before I go much, much farther. We did not have any type of dance program when we came to when I came to Emory. And I felt that Emory, above all educational institutions that I knew, needed a dance department. I thought our students needed the dance. I thought the campus needed the dance. Uh, so I think Clyde Parton came this afternoon to make sure I would tell the truth about <laughs> all of this. But uh, I fought, and I pushed, and I fought, and I pushed. And we began to get a few dance courses in before we had the new building. But then after we had the new building, we did have a dance studio. And uh, the dance program started growing in leaps and bounds. Uh, we, had, we were able to hire two professional uh, people to come in, and they certainly did a good job getting our dance program started. I will say now that on the Emory campus, a student can receive a major and a minor in the dance program. They have five full-time dance faculty on their staff. They have a, a person who does all of the costuming, and it is just remarkable how it has grown. Of course, they do have all of their um, 
uh, recitals in the uh, Performing Arts Center. Uh, they not only perform here on campus, they are also invited to go off. So if the one thing that, that I do have to brag about, I do have to brag just a little bit about, about the dance program. Uh, I think Parton probably got very tired of hearing that, but uh, I wasn't going to stop before it did become a reality. Um, let's see. When I first started uh, teaching at Emory, we had uh, eight people in the department, six men and two women. Uh, we did not grow just a lot until 1983 because we simply did not have the space to, to put other people, to put other faculty member, members. Even though the uh, student body was growing in leaps and bounds, we still did not have enough, enough spaces in our building to put uh, uh, another faculty member. Uh, and to give you just an example, in 1983, well, let me go back, in 1958, we taught about 30 to 34 classes in physical education per quarter then. We were still we were on the quarter system. In 1983, the number had risen to about 70 courses per semester. In 2008, 2009, this particular uh, year, in the fall, they offered 91 classes in physical education. And in the spring semester, they're offering 78. Few numbers about athletics. In 1958, as I mentioned, there were six people uh, on the physical education faculty, but they also did the coaching. In 2008, this school year, there are a total of 18 varsity sports, nine men and nine women. They also offer 25 club sports. The number that participate in intramurals, just unbelievable on the campus. Um, an idea that was tossed out about what you might talk about is your social activity. And I thought about this, and being in physical education and in athletics, I've been an activist just as long as I've been in the profession. You really had to be an activist to get a lot of things accomplished. It took a long time. Title IX certainly helped. In fact, that's what put us over with the legality of women being offered the same as men on college campuses. And then a lot of the women in, the, in uh, my field disagreed when the NCAA wanted to take the women under their umbrella. But I was one of them that thought we should go that way because I knew that's where the, the power was and that's where the money was. And I just felt that's the, need, the way we needed to go. And since we have gone that way, all of you people have seen what happened on college campuses, on professional sports, as far as women's athletics are concerned. As I started off, I said I was, I was very lucky to get a job here at, at Emory. I still feel very much that way. Uh, I don't think I would have uh, enjoyed being anything else as much as I did at Emory. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Young Fong, and we're, we're getting shorter as we come along, <laughs> shorter time. I went to University of Michigan for um, <clears throat> medical school for my medical degree. Uh, my first year, I met a guy who studied pharmacology, and eventually I married him. That's Dr. Stephen Holtzman, see right down there. And uh, we married last year of medical school, my medical school, and he got a PhD in pharmacology. And I never heard about Emory until he offered a postdoc job. So we came down direct from Michigan all the way down to Atlanta and in 1969. And I, he got an offer as a postdoc, and I come down to look for my internship. And uh, I was interviewed by a medical doctor in medicine. And he said, well, you do research? I said, yes. Uh, you have very good credential, uh, but you're not going to medicine, internal medicine. You're going to anesthesiology, right? I said, yes. 
He said, we don't need you. I was so sad. That was a Friday night, rainy day, and I went, went back to hotel. And the next morning, Saturday, we're supposed to leave, and uh, I was get fortunate to, uh, my husband say, maybe we should go to the hospital, take a look if we can find anybody. I was lucky enough to find, meet the chairman of the anesthesiology department, Dr. Steinhaus. He's 92 years old now. And he and I, we talk about two hours, and the results is he already filled up two internship positions. He say, if you choose me first, I will create a position for you. So the rest is history. But anyway, when I was a junior faculty, and he made me to start a service, uh, that's a hospital service. Subsequently, I started a total of five service. One's in hospital, one's in Wesley Woods, and the three in ambulatory surgery center. And Emory, because I'm the only female on faculty around that time, made me very strong. I want to be a real good physician. So I stood up to the surgeons because they respect me. I bailed their patient out. If they got a patient bleeding, the patient has trouble, I bail them out because my philosophy is I like to treat the patient the way I like to be treated. And uh, <clears throat> so it made me a good administrator because I started the service. And I also a researcher. I did a lot of clinic research since clinic, Emory Clinic doesn't encourage it for research work. So I say, well, in that case, for basic science wise, I cannot do research, but I like to do some clinical research. So I did a lot of research on my patient. And all my patients particip participate in research, they really enjoy what we did. I yeah, give them a new anesthetic. Next time they come back, they ask for more. I say, no, FDA hasn't approved this yet, <laughs> you know, something like that. <clears throat> so thanks to Dr. Steinhaus' encouragement, I become a first female professor in my department, more than 50 years of history. And because of my husband's encouragement, we have very few female faculty in medical school. And I was mentoring medical student, male or female, no discrimination. And uh, also, especially the minority during my tenure. And I also mentoring for some junior faculties, especially minorities, and uh, who were junior than, than I was, like a surgery <coughs> and anesthesiology department. And uh, even in the pharmacology department. So I really enjoy what I've done, and Emory trained me to be a strong character and uh, also a good physician as well as a good administrator. Thank you. Thank you. Julianne? I'm Julianne Dathan. My uh, tenor at Emory, not my tenure, but my tenor began in 1958 when I arrived as a student, much against my older brother's uh, protestations. He was by then in medical school, uh, told my parents don't let Julianne apply to Emory College because she will not be accepted. She's not Emory material. <laughs> that uh, Emory had a quota on the number of undergraduate women and I was not going to be acceptable within that quota. Long story short, I got in and found that what he said was true, that women had been so recently admitted into the college, I think it was 55, 53, Ginger, and this was 58, right. And uh, the professors really didn't want to call upon the women in the class. Not that there were very many of us at a time, there were about 1,700 men in the College of Arts and Sciences and 300 women. So there may have been five or six of us in any given humanities or science classes. Uh, the, you'd wave your hand, wave your hand, and finally give up because you knew you were going to have to settle for a B regardless of how much you knew. Well, I was lucky enough to get through all of that, graduate, go away, do some other things, go to graduate school, come back. In 1970, the Vietnam War was really kicking up. Emory students were protesting 
in just short of violent ways. They were setting fires to the trash cans in the quadrangle up and down by the buildings. They held the president, the then president, hostage for nine hours, okay. trying to get him to get the board of trustees to sign the paper, a petition, to give to Coca-Cola that maybe Coca-Cola could do something about the war and stopping the Vietnam War, at least make a big fuss about this. The Atlanta media was full of this. There was a new dean of women, a new dean of men. The previous ones had resigned or retired, and everything seemed to be in chaos out here. So as an interested alum, I came out to see the, new, the then new dean of women. And since 80% of the undergraduate population was Greek-related uh, sororities and fraternities, I said, look, I was Greek. I'll work with the sorority girls and try to settle things down through them to the fraternity guys. Well, she said, can you come to work Monday morning? I said, I don't need a job. <laughs> I'm working at Georgia State. I'm in my doctoral program. And she said, well, I need you here. So I came, sure enough. There were only 300 women still in the college. There were up to five women in the medical school, up to five were admissible. Bob, do you remember those days? Maybe they would take two or three. In 1972, all that changed. The law school had no women on their faculty, neither did Candler School of Theology. To get into the graduate school, if you were a woman, either your daddy paid or your husband paid. There was no financial aid for women. Uh, Dr. Green can attest to that. She finished in 67 with her PhD in the ILA. It was really a dismal situation for women. There were so many glass ceilings you couldn't even see up that high to see whether you could get through them or not. Uh, there was a senior administrator, a male, who was uh, as part of his duties to keep those uppity women quiet on the campus, the administrative women. I was junior administrative, of course but there were senior faculty women who were beginning to kick up a little sand about unequal salaries and the things that were finally solved in the early, uh, through legislation in the early 70s and, and throughout the rest of the 70s. The uh, entry of Dr. Jim Laney as president in 76 really changed the tone on this campus. Uh, he did a lot of things to resolve inequities among students and funding for athletics and residential availability for women students and married student housing and so on. So it got to be a different climate. Why did I stay here so long uh, through the 90s? You know, with the increased enrollment with that legislation that passed in 72 that said that the feds were gonna rescind your funding if you did not accept admissible students regardless of gender, national origin, sexual orientation, and all the things that that covered. Uh, indeed, uh, women students began in this increasing enrollment onslaught. It was really amazing. We had to scurry and build more dorms, uh, excuse me, residential facilities, <laughs> and, and, you know, to accommodate <clears throat> this increasing influx. By the 80s, the College of Arts and Sciences was over 50% female, as was the law school in the mid to late 80s, as in the 90s the medical school became, and certainly the graduate school and the theology school. Nursing school began to admit men, you know, much over the protestations of some of the senior faculty women in the nursing school. Uh, the dental school, which closed in the 80s, uh, produced one of our most outstanding women alumni, uh, Mary Lynn Morgan, Dr. Morgan is here today. Um, and is a strong supporter of women's concerns. You know, the issues that we had were soon resolved by senior male administrators and, and the influx of female senior administrators. It was so hard for us to find mentors in the 70s and early into the 80s. We had people, senior women, who nurtured us, but they were not free to mentor us. And we began to identify wonderful mentors. We were able to learn to mentor. We found and were recognizing mentors among senior men who nurtured us. Lord, I mentored so many students throughout the university 
who were male, that more of them stay in touch with me now than the females whom I mentored. They're out mentoring others, you know. So it's been a great ride for me. It was the perfect time, perfect place. My father always told us, children, my brothers and I, when we were growing up, don't ever go to work for money. Find some people who are being of service to others, and if you respect what they're doing, see if you can find a way to join them. The money will follow. I found people being of service. It challenged my potential. I learned a whole lot and enjoyed all of it. So Daddy was right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Liz? I'm Elizabeth Sharp, and uh, I uh, came to Emory in 1970. I will preface this by saying that I am a nurse midwife, and uh, at that time, nurse midwifery was still uh, very sparsely distributed through the United States, uh, and certainly there was no nurse midwife in Georgia that was practicing, and uh, the closest nurse midwifery was in Mississippi uh, when I came here in 1970. And it was really pretty much luck that I got here, and that is because um, in 1970, Dr. Thompson, chairman of the department and Newton Long vice chair, and with great interest in nurse midwifery because he had worked with nurse midwives, been the medical director of nurse midwifery at Johns Hopkins Hospital, Johns Hopkins University, and uh, he had always said, I came here with the understanding that at some time when it was ripe, when it was possible, we would have a nurse midwifery service. And I had been a student of Dr. Thompson's uh, in Baltimore when I was a Yale student and went down to um, uh, Hopkins for the summer clinical experience. Uh, what actually happened that was luck was that um, there was to be a speaker at a symposium on nurse midwifery, a nurse midwife, who wasn't able to come, and they asked me to come. Dr. Thompson brought together professionals, you know, medicine, nursing, social work, a variety of people and business people and lawyers to a um, continuing education program, a symposium, <laughs> about nurse midwifery. He wanted to test the climate to see if it would be possible to introduce nurse midwifery uh, in 1970. And as it turned out, I spoke at the conference and saw Dr. Long, and they were talking about, yes, they probably would move ahead and they would be recruiting. And uh, I announced that I had just resigned um, from the faculty for the upcoming year at Yale University School of Nursing. And I had been a graduate of that program in nurse midwifery and had worked on the faculty um, before and after my doctorate. So over about an 11 year span, I had been very involved with Yale and loved Yale. But the reason I was making a change was that the Yale New Haven Hospital did not have enough obstetric patients for faculty, medical students, residents, and nurse midwifery students and faculty. And I wasn't that old in the profession, and I had not had years and years of experience, and I really felt that I needed to be in a location or in a setting where I could practice what I was going to be teaching or was teaching. So that's why I was making a shift. And um, so I came down for interviews and um, thought that th things would be really wonderful. There was a real need for help in obstetrics in that time, uh, 1970, when the number of patients at Grady Hospital were well into the 7,080s on the obstetric service, and there were not enough residents and faculty to deliver or to be attendants at the birth of all the women, and they desperately needed help. The residents needed help, and also Dr. Long and Dr. Thompson felt that it would be helpful for the, the learners to see what normal birth was about and what the care could be with family-centered uh, nursing, um, that nurse midwives certainly um, promoted. Uh, so we were to start a service, we were to teach medical students, we were eventually to start a nurse midwifery educational program. So I left Yale and came down in 1970. And actually, as I look back on it, when you asked how it went when I came and what was here, um, as probably all you know, the medical school has for many, many years been responsible for the health care of patients at Grady Memorial Hospital. And our chairman in gynecology and obstetrics was very concerned about their health, um, that the, the, the high prematurity rate needed to be reduced, uh, maternal mortality, um, neonatal deaths, 
very concerned about the situation here at Grady, but he was also involved nationally um, and on the President's Council for looking at how to uh, reduce prematurity. So we had really a very um, excellent service with a strong mission here and more far-reaching. Um, my coming, of course, was sort of shaky because in this state and many states in the South and even throughout the country, over the years there had been a real effort to decrease or to, as some people said, eliminate the lay or granny midwife, particularly in the South at, where it was very popular uh, before hospitals developed and roads uh, were able to be traveled and women could get to the hospital. So many, many women were delivered by lay midwives um, in this state and others and supervised by the health department. So there was some concern about negativity towards what I represented. The confusion about a midwife, you know, attended births in the home versus a nurse midwife who was going to be in a hospital working in collaboration with physicians. Uh, as it turned out, uh, there was such fine introduction of the nurse midwives at Grady and also um, of me in the university. I remember coming down for interviews, being interviewed by the president, the vice president of health sciences, the um, administrator of the hospital. Mary Woody, director of nursing at Grady, was a nationally known nurse who was very familiar with the development of what we now call advanced nurse practice, of which nurse midwifery has been a part in many educational um, institutions. So there was, a, and I was introduced to people at the state health department, at the clinics, uh, the, the two um, uh, county clinic health departments. So I was really introduced, and the, pay, the way was paved for me to come and then to employ nurse midwives in a nurse midwifery service. It eventually had 23 nurse midwives, and we were doing approximately a third of the births at Grady. So we really did meet a need and eventually started an educational program. But I think it was with the very careful introduction and with the respect and expectation that this oddity, a nurse midwife coming down, would be integrated into the service. And um, it was novel. I remember when I was um, coming out of the delivery room after conduct, you know, participating in the first birth of one that I had helped a mother have her baby, and I put the baby on the mother's abdomen, and that shocked people, and then I, you know, everything was finished, and I went to go out the door, and as I walked out, I knocked people down because about four or five people had been peering in the little window to see what this nurse midwife was doing. And then, of course, they were talking later about what I did do, which was, you know, like, show the mother the baby and put it on her abdomen and help her put it to breast, for breastfeeding, and, and the various things that we were doing as nurse midwives that were perceived as different. Um, so I really have fond memories of those days. And then as time went on, yes, indeed, we started an educational program. Um, and nurse midwifery developed throughout the state. And it's very satisfying to know that today, Georgia ranks second in the number of midwife conducted births in the whole country. So it says that what we started seemed to have a ripple effect throughout the state, which leads me to say, Oh, and I do want to comment, because I know that nursing is here, and nursing is very important to me, because nursing is my roots. And I, um, when I was interviewed here, at the time, the nursing school did not see nurse midwifery as nursing. They saw it as little doctoring. But I would not come without an appointment in the School of Nursing, although my primary appointment was in the School of Medicine. And over time, um, the nursing school became interested in an educational program, and so we were um, very, very satisfied in being able to eventually accomplish that, and, um, and then a dual degree program. And the other thing I would say about the overall experience is there was always something new to explore, and I see Bob DeHaan here, uh, who was involved in starting uh, the Exploring an Ethics Center at Emory. And Emory University and the department, uh, School of Medicine, were very open to us as faculty exploring different avenues that might be important and have relevance. So I always found there was something new on the horizon to do, and, uh, and I'm happy to say the Nurse Midwifery Service is still in existence at Grady, which is remarkable, remarkable because so many of the large hospitals have closed their services.
Thank you, Liz. Betty? Uh, I came here in 1981 because I got married in 1980. Would you mind if you find an interesting statistic? I married uh, Howard Tatum, Dr. Howard Tatum, who uh, invented the IUD that prevented more unwanted pregnancies than any other form of uh, contraception. And we've been, uh, both been working in family planning for years, and so we were kind of a natural team. So we got married, and it wasn't terribly long, probably just a few months, and we were sitting in a plane one day, and he said to me, Betty, I want to get out of New York. He had been at Rockefeller University for about 16 years. He said, I'm sick of shoveling snow, and I want to go south. And I said, okay. And so uh, we decided we ought to look at what we wanted, and so we made a list. Wanted a good medical school wanted a good faculty, wanted good support staff, including particularly nurses, and we wanted to have a good patient situation so we could continue to de re do research and write papers, and we wanted a good airport because we were both doing an awful lot of work uh, internationally. So if we made the list, and then we reached into the pocket in the plane seat in front of us and pulled out a map, and we picked out five southern cities. And then we lined the five cities up against our list, and we decided it was obvious. Embry was where we wanted to go. So we uh, looked into it, and Dan Thompson, as uh, he seems to come in our lives here, and, and Howard had been uh, faculty together at uh, Tulane. And since he and I had done a lot of work uh, internationally, we knew a lot of people at CDC. And at that time, you had to come and make presentations. So we did. We gave talks at Emory. We gave talks at CDC. And the faculties of both said, yep, we'd like to have you come. But we were heading out to Africa at that point to do some work, and uh, we had not been approved by the Board of Trustees. And so while we were there, we'd only been there a couple of days, and Dan Thompson cabled us and he said, well, the faculty has decided that you're worthy. And so the people at CDC said, yeah, yeah, you're worthy too. So there we were, and we came, came to Emory. Now, I arrived with two sort of unusual things. I arrived as a full tenured professor, which was pretty unusual in, in uh, those days. And I also arrived with a husband. And that was also extremely unusual because this was sheer nepotism for many, many years to have a husband and a wife arrive in the same faculty, in the same medical school, was very much unheard of for many, many years. In my experience, the men would get full professorship and the women would get assistant professor, sometimes, if they're lucky, associate professor, and rarely could you end up in the same department. So I felt that this was really a very fortunate thing that we were able to come together. We had everything that we wanted, we went down the list and we decided, yes, that this is what we wanted. And things began to change in a lot of ways uh, even before we got here, and some of this has been alluded to. Uh, when I was in medical school, there were very few of us. We were a, a rare breed. And there were very few uh, medical students, interns, resident faculty members who had ovaries. They were an unusual. <laughs> And a rare and unusual uh, commodity. And uh, we didn't always get the best of our uh, work ethic. I can remember very well going back a ways uh, when I was an American Cancer Fellow, the first fellow with ovaries they'd ever had. And I proved what I was doing because I was eight months pregnant at the time that I started my, my, uh, my fellowship. And I had no room. And I want to tell you, I was quite a sight, sleeping on a gurney in the hallway, eight months 
pregnant. <laughs> now, things began to change even before we got here. And the same thing happened at Emory during the time since we arrived. And happily, so many places, including Emory, many departments of OBGYN now are more than half women. And many, many minorities are coming into the field where they did not exist back in the days when I was a medical student. So as we look back over the years, uh, we thought about it and we thought about our lists. And we said, yeah, we made the right decision and it was. Thank you, Patty. Marianne? Well, I arrived in Atlanta in 1970 and I had moved from New England and uh, I was involved in consciousness raising groups up there around childbirth and, and uh, I was really wanted to be part of the uh, revolution in childbirth and I moved to Atlanta. I had three children but I heard that Emory had a master's degree in maternal and infant health and I thought well this is a good credential that might help me and uh, I was teaching childbirth classes and um, so I enrolled at Emory and I thought well, with three children maybe I'll just do one course at a time. So I was accepted and I did one course and then one of the faculty and it might have been uh, Dr. O'Shea said you know if you come full time we have funding. <laughs> so I dropped out <laughs> and I came work. back I came back the next year and uh, went two years and finished my master's degree in maternal and infant health and um, at that time childbirth revolution was, hadn't happened. Uh, I went to, around and visited obstetricians and s to tell them that I wanted to have, uh, have them advertise my childbirth classes and they said, oh no, no, no. Southern women don't want to do that. You know, we have this magic drug, they won't feel anything, and I thought, I don't think so. <laughs> so um, after I graduated, I uh, worked in a private practice for several years and I did find that all the patients in the practice uh, wanted to have natural childbirth, not all, but a lot of them, and they wanted to come to childbirth classes and so I did that for several years and about that same time Dr. Sharp started the midwifery program at Emory and I thought, oh rats, I was just two years, three years too early. But fortunately, um, the, they decided that they would take one or two postmasters uh, nurses into the midwifery program. So that's how um, I uh, got into midwifery and I uh, finished that in 79 and I went back to that private practice because then I thought, you know, midwives, uh, it was, we had a lot of press, surely in this private practice that pretty soon I'll have hospital privileges and I'll deliver all these women who came to see me. <laughs> Well, that didn't happen. The head of OBGYN at that hospital said, over my dead body will we have nurse midwives delivering at my hospital. <laughs> and he was fairly young, so that was depressing. Uh, <laughs> I didn't see this happening. And I had, at that time, had four or five years experience, and I worked at Grady um, on the weekends, getting deliveries under my belt, as they say. And um, fortunately, Dr. Sharp had an opening in the nurse midwifery program and invited me to join the faculty, which I did. And I was there uh, for almost 20 years. And so um, things changed in that hospital where I couldn't get privileges. Uh, I think the, the um, nurse midwives deliver about uh, 15 or 20 percent of all the babies now. And, uh, at Northside Hospital, which is the largest hospital, maternity hospital, nurse midwives deliver close to 40% of the babies. And I think that this just attests to Dr. Sharp's uh, foresight in coming here. And I'm personally very grateful that that happened. And I retired from Emory in 2000 and then went to the CDC for five years. Thank you, Marianne. Brenda. My name is Brenda Bynum, and I came here in 1983, and I stood on the shoulders of these goddesses who came before me. Uh, by the time I got here, the glass ceiling for my discipline was much lower than it was for women. I was in theater studies, and uh, the founding year of the Department of Theater Studies at Emory was the academic year 1982-1983. 
I was uh, primarily in the professional theater at that time, even though I had already taught from time to time at three uh, separate universities. I was hired to be in a play, to play Hecuba, Queen Hecuba, in the spring of that first season. Uh, and the MGM Theater, which is here now, was completely flooded with construction dirt and sand and in order to make that production authentic. At the end of that production, the uh, head of the department and the director of that play asked me would I stay on and begin teaching. And I said, of course, I lived in the neighborhood. It was perfect. So I replaced a man whose contract was not renewed so that I could begin teaching. I think that's cool. Uh, and I stayed here for 17 years, retiring in 2000. The department had a very slow start. Uh, outside the theater, uh, all we had was an office, the office of the director. Classrooms were where we could find them. I spent one very memorable semester teaching my class in the visiting men's locker room behind the basketball court <laughs> in Woodruff Gym. Uh, I taught several, a number of semesters in various places in the Woodruff Gym, none other quite so aromatic as that. Um, there were times when my home was closer to my classroom than my office on campus because our department really didn't come together until we were lucky enough to get moved into one of those World War II barracks, which used to be over there where uh, Schwartz Center is now. We stayed there happily for many years until the B School decided that the Rich Building was uninhabitable and moved into Goizueta, and we got the Rich Building, and they're still there and happy to have it. <laughs> so it was quite an odyssey. It was my good fortune coming in at the very bottom as the first faculty member to uh, be able to build, help build that department in a way that you don't often have such opportunities to do, to be on, on the very ground floor. It was a terrific uh, thing for me. I was happy to be there. And now I will say that that department, I called over to ask, they now have 15 faculty members and almost 70 majors and minors. So things have turned out very well indeed. Thank you, Brenda. Other than the nursing school, I was the first woman dean, permanent woman dean of any college of Emory. That has changed happily in the last couple of years. We've got um, a woman dean of the graduate school and of the theology school and obviously of the nursing school as well. I am going to not say any more about myself because the President's Commission on the Status of Women has already done um, recorded my reflections, and we want to use this time to um, to have our panelists share some of their other thoughts. Now, you all have been here for many, many years. You've talked about the institution. In what ways has Emory enriched and changed your lives during this time that you were here? Liz, well, go ahead. Just jump in. Yeah. I think I was you know, beginning to talk about that when yeah. I spoke earlier, mm -hmm. is that um, clearly I knew that there were certain things that I had to do, you know, being, you know, have a nurse midwifery service, develop an educational program. Um, and as a faculty, there was still the latitude to be highly involved in my profession, national professional organization as well as the local group, but nationally, and to participate fully in that over the years. There was the opportunity to participate in things that came up at Emory. I already mentioned the Ethics Center. Um, and work, uh, when we developed the dual degree program uh, that Mary Hall and others in the faculty at the School of Nursing worked with Dr. Gangarosa on, it put me in touch, and my doctorate is in public health, so it was a nice fit. So then I was involved with the faculty and the programs over there, and particularly in maternal and child health. Um, and then there were opportunities to move outside the university to be a consultant to the state as the state was developing nurse midwifery mm -hmm. projects. Um, so I felt that as a faculty member, it was, it was expected. I mean, it seemed to just be natural. And, ex and then 
seem to be of interest to others on the faculty and to Dr. Thompson and School of Nursing Dean and so forth, that, that we reach out so that we were able to do a variety of things that we felt needed to be done and yet it made it very exciting for me to have always new things to work on develop and then to see others coming up working in the areas that you know we had sort of gotten started and I was delighted when Mary Ann walked in and said she would you know wonder if she could be a part of the faculty mm -hmm. I was thrilled mm -hmm. so that you know some came back to teach on the faculty and the current um, uh, director of the nurse midwifery program was in our very first nurse midwifery class but she had practice in other areas was involved in the first and only birth center in Atlanta um, so she was certainly prepared to teach um, so I would say that I had a very interesting life as a faculty member and felt that we had been successful and that was very satisfying mm -hmm. to me and then to be involved in other things so I felt that I gained a lot by being a part of Emory mm -hmm. and um, having the kinds of things I cared about really working mm -hmm. and then exploring new mm -hmm. vistas for me. I'll jump in here. <clears throat> I began to talk about it and then decided to cut my remarks shorter. I learned the difference between nurturing and mentoring. Uh, I had said that the stage was set that senior faculty women found it very difficult to to mentor the younger faculty or the younger or junior administrators because there was so much intervention among the, the men. They didn't want the women to get together, in other words. So we got a lot of nurturing from these senior women and not much mentoring until Dr. Laney kind of cleared the air in the mid-70s here. Uh, I'm the last dean of women that Emory will have had, I pray. Uh, pray that that will be so. Uh, I, I also pray that the mentoring that I received and learned how to give, as I said earlier, not only to the men and uh, to the women, but also to the men students, that that is still going on and that, that senior men are mentoring the younger uh, women faculty and students and vice versa with senior women mentoring younger, the younger male faculty and such. It's just so healthy, you know. Uh, nurturing is where, you know, Ginger Kane, who is a great student and a leader and very innovative and creative as a student, I would say to her, great job, Ginger. Pat her on the back. That was a great talk you gave to the sorority last night and so forth. Keep up the good work. That is wonderful nurturing when you really mean it. However, mentoring is picking up the phone and calling somebody call Linda Books in the library and say, I have a student here who's a freshman who needs to make some sorority money to help her team and all this stuff. Have you got a little job over there? And Linda Books says, well, send her over here and we'll talk to her. That's mentoring. Linda Books hired her and now Ginger's the university archivist. You know, there's story after story of outcomes of mentoring. And the healthiest and most appropriate place for it to begin to turn old children into young adults is on the college campus. And to turn young adults into mature, proactive, creative people is within a university community. So I thank Emory a lot for enriching my life in that way. I, I actually agree. And I was able to, um, in my years at Emory, really explore avenues um, that, had, that dealt with women. And so I, early on, I got involved with the Women's Center. And um, this is right after it started, maybe in 94, 95. And one area that, um, in a conversation with Allie, that we, we were talking about, it was at the same time that the American Academy of Pediatrics came out and said, all babies should be breastfed until they're one year old. And we were chatting, we're thinking, and, these women who are coming back to Emory and where are they going to pump their breasts and how is that going to happen here? And so we um, thought about it and started something or opened something, found a room in the trailer and designated a nursing nest and bought a breast pump for women. And it became a very heavily used area. And not only did women come there to breastfeed, I mean to pump their breasts, 
but their partners or husbands would bring babies at lunchtime, and so the mothers could uh, feed the babies during the day. Prior to this, I think faculty would, would not have a problem um, breastfeeding or pumping their breasts in their offices, but we found out that graduate students and staff used the restrooms, and that was a major impetus to look into this. And I'm happy to say that the President's Commission on the Status of Women took this cause up, and they now have a lactation support program, which is Emory mm -hmm. University Policy 4.91. <laughs> uh, there are 16 areas designated on Emory's campus for uh, lactating mothers. Uh, every building, every new building has to have a designated lactation space. So when you think about changes, and um, that was one major change with, um, that happened during my tenure mm -hmm. here. I think one of the nicest things about being at Emory was to have a chance to continue interests that we came with mm -hmm. and, and advance them. Look at uh, different methods of birth control and uh, allow women to choose how they would spend their lives. Uh, to have control over their reproduction meant so much to women having started clinics in New York City in the barrios. I, I lived for years with watching what happened to women who had no control over their lives. And I must admit there were quite a few at Grady who had had very, very bad years until we gave them the opportunity uh, to control their fertility. They go back to school, get degrees, and it was just so exciting to see things that happened to women who suddenly were able to be in, in control of their lives. So that was very important. And also the ability to run programs, to uh, collaborate with CDC and places around the world where we knew people. Very supportive. I ran for 10 years a program here uh, that some of the people here talked at uh, on family planning. And uh, everything was very supportive. And I think it was interesting to watch not only the women, but the women going through training. Uh, we were a little bit combative. You know, we had to be not just as good as the men, we had to be better. And it was interesting to watch the psychology of how things went along. I remember going to the American College of OBGYN and they had four women my generation sitting one side and four sitting on the other. And I suddenly realized times had changed. We were combative. They were not. They didn't have to be. They had moved into the mainstream, and we were there at the birth, and it was very exciting. I would like to say that Emory and the Women's Center and uh, my department supported me over the years in the development of almost a dozen uh, original plays and performance pieces based on the lives of real women, uh, all of which were presented here somewhere through the years. And that was a remarkable opportunity for me, which I would not have had, I hesitate to say, in the real world, but that's, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I, I was mentored by two uh, male, uh, one's my chairman, former chairman, and my former vice chairman. And because Emory has so few female in, on the faculty around my time, and that they, there's a few, but mostly they, they want to work with the family, they don't want to do a lot of work, and they don't want to do research, they don't want to do this, they don't want to do that, you know, so they, sometimes they want to work part-time, things like that. But uh, I think if you want to do the job, you better do well. So uh, I work like twice or three times harder than some male colleague. So you stand up, you know, you stood up uh, uh, among the, the, your colleague. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, once you made yourself reputation, uh, you know, the surgeon usually, they always blame my anesthesiologist and they uh, complain about anesthesiology. You guys probably all know about this. <laughs> and uh, uh, I even s s stood up in front of the surgeon and tell them what to do, tell them how well they should take care of the patient, you know. And one time, one surgeon, he's, he was not a very sur good surgeon. He left uh, Emory subsequently. And he came to me, he said, you know, Yang Fang, surgeon is captain of the ship. I told him, I said, if you were captain of a ship, the ship sunk. 
<laughs> so he back off because he then made a lot of mistakes during the surgical procedures. So I put in my office, told him, you know, you should have done that, you should, you know, you should have consult with your senior colleague or whatever, you know. So, so that settles that. But anyway, so, you know, you, you, the Emory, in a way, you know, have a less female around that time, but they, it make me as a strong character and to protect my patient, to put, you know, to, to make Emory even look better. You know, she reminds me of how difficult it was when you first start getting out and doing things. Because uh, after I came to Emory, I started getting on FDA committees and running them and doing this and doing that. And it took me a year or two to get over the fact that I was probably being offered these things because I had ovaries. And I think a lot of women go through this, that they realized in the very beginning, they don't give a damn about me. I have ovaries and they want women in those slots. And it's a curious psychological phenomenon that women go through from feeling they've been bought to feeling that they're there mm. because they want you there because mm. you're worth something. Mm -hmm. And that's very much the same experience that you, you mentioned. It's a very curious phenomenon. Mm. I have to say, I, I never had some of these feelings. In, in, in the building I was working in, Mr. McDonough was one of the kindest, most gentle persons I've ever known. And he always stood up for the women. Always stood up for the women. Clyde Parton trained under Mr. McDonough, and so Clyde was very much that way. And I didn't have to feel that I had to fight my way out of anything, or I did have to fight for a dance program, but we simply <laughs> didn't have a place for it, and uh, I still thought it was very important. But I don't know, I guess participating against some, some guys in some of the sports that I did when I was growing up, I, I just never had this feeling. I just never had to, to feel like I, I've got to fight against that man to get any place I want to go. Maybe I was lucky. Yeah. You should have gone to medical school. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what you said. You should have gone to school. Well, right. Yeah, right. Um, I, I can you know, certainly I, understand. I think we mentioned that um, women were only here in, uh, admitted to Emory College 1953. Three. And clearly, the numbers that uh, in the subsequent decades were so few for women. And so each of you was a pioneer in many, many different ways, having different kinds of experiences. Are there any other things that you want to have recorded for this history? Your, your perspective on this is unique in the history of, um, of Emory. So now is now's the moment. If there are other uh, aspects of your experience as a woman or how you've seen uh, the experience for women change at Emory, it would be good to, to, um, to record that. And obviously, we've, we've spoken about this some already. I promised that I wasn't going to say anything, but maybe I, maybe I should. I came in 1967. Um, uh, they were not... Uh, Financial aid for women was very, very limited. Um, and I can remember um, being assigned the, I was on the ILA Graduate Council and being assigned the, the odious task of going to a faculty meeting and um, uh, trying to get the faculty ex to explain why women were not given financial aid. And I remember one of my great mentors, the Austrian Gregor Zeba, I don't know if any of you remember him, um, uh, pounding on the table saying that this was not a Boy Scout camp here <laughs> and we, um, we would do things the way we wanted to do them. <laughs> um, but we felt, we felt nonetheless uh, supported by individual faculty members. Um, and somehow made it through. And it was a great pleasure to come back for myself to Emory. 
uh, to see the work that all of you had done for the last 30 years in this interim period in making Emory a very, very different place for, for women. So um, as uh, Brenda has acknowledged you all as goddesses, um, <laughs> I do too because I could see the, uh, when I came back in 99, I could see the great uh, changes that had been made. Any other comments on um, your perspectives on Emory, your history here, how Emory affected your lives? Um. I, I think of over those years, and Emory really changed. I think Emory become more open mind mm -hmm. ever been. Um, I during my time, <clears throat> there was the first black medical student. I think his name is Hamilton. Holmes. Uh, Holmes. Hamilton. Right. Hamilton. Holmes. And uh, later on, he became the first orthopedic doctor. And uh, I worked with him. And uh, that, was, that was, but he passed away, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. He was medical mm -hmm. director at Grady. Yeah. First black medical director at Grady Hospital. In, in Grady, too. I, I had a contact with him when he worked in Emory Hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, things change. You know, I. The reason I like to mentor a lot of different uh, minority uh, student, you know, medical student, I, I did a lot of work with uh, um, minority medical student, as well as um, faculty, you know, things like that, because I am first generation immigrant. And I was born in mainland China and came to this country and I made it legally. Okay, and I, I say, if I can do it, so is everybody else. So, you know, but Emory used to be, you know, very, very few uh, minority uh, people, you know, I'm mean, female, don't even mention it, but anyway, so now things change, and we have an excellent neurosurgeon who's black, uh, African American, you know, and that we have an excellent dermatologist who's African-American, and I think that's great. You know, Emory become a better and better place for everybody to work, and I think that's very nice, not only just for female. I think the other thing that's changed, and it's certainly changed at Emory, and, and uh, in general, is the feeling that we can do things that we didn't do before. Uh, I, when I was coming out of residency, uh, I was told, Make sure you get into dermatology or pediatrics. I wanted to be a general surgeon. And I was told, it's bad enough you're a woman. For heaven's sakes, don't try to break into any surgical specialty. And uh, so I did. I did got to be a cancer fellow, so I got to do a, a lot of big surgery, but uh, still in OBGYN. This is another thing I think has changed. The nursing attitudes have changed, our change. I, I always used to say every year in my clinics, I fire a doctor and hire a nurse and the care gets better and better. <laughs> and it did, it really did. So I, I think we've watched the progression of, of women, uh -huh. at, it, not only in numbers, but in what they're doing. As you look around, boy, there are a lot of women now doing orthopedics and general surgery and neurosurgery. That was totally unheard of. And to watch this blossom out uh -huh. at Emory, and a lot of other places, it's really very exciting, very rewarding. You know, the background on that, Betty, and I did my dissertation in a study that, you know, that'd be a whole nother seminar here. However, the more invasive the procedure, the higher paying the specialty. <laughs> You're right. And the white gatekeepers of those specialty training programs, white haired gatekeepers for the most part, mm -hmm. wanted to steer the women into the lower paying specialties such as child psychiatry, pediatrics, dermatology. some dermatology, family planning. Right. OBGYN was at that time very high paying through the 50s, 60s and early 70s. And then all of a sudden the liability got so great that it dropped down and women began to enter at greater frequency. But the more invasive the procedure for that specialty, the higher pay. You know, it was interesting. I, I did a lot of running around the country and talking and doing TV and stuff. And I, I learned that there is a very interesting change occurring. When 
a woman went into practice in a group, she had the number of patients in one year, it took the average male three years to achieve. And I had a lot of um, male sort of stuffy professors who'd say, women have no place in OBGYN. And I say, women like to go to women. And he said, no, they don't. They really <laughs> just, they really, they don't trust women. They'd rather they go to men. And I must admit, when I was a general practitioner, our patients split at the waist. I took them from the waist down, and my husband took them from the waist up. So it, it really was a, a major, major difference. Well, um, I want to thank you all. We, we probably also need to thank Ali Crown for dreaming up this designation of unsung, unsung heroines, because um, these women really have made enormous gifts to this university, and uh, I think we need to thank them. <laughs> um, we invite you to come down to Brooks Commons downstairs to join us for a little reception and a chance to uh, interact with um, all of these unsung heroines. Done so. Done so. <laughs> done so. We've been done so ourselves now. <laughs> yeah.